Hi, I'm Mike McLean. Welcome to the Short Circuit Podcast, brought to you by Swift Aircraft. In this series, we'll be chatting with a variety of people from all walks of life, but who all have one thing in common, aviation. We'll discuss how and why they got into aviation, what or who inspired them, and what they would say to encourage young people to get involved. Flight fascinates many of us, and our guests will explain why they are compelled to look to the sky. Today's guest is Michelle Brown. She's currently employed as a business development executive for an international law firm, and is also a freelance writer and content generator. So what does this have to do with aviation, I hear you ask? Well, I first met Michelle about 10 years ago on a windy airfield in Northamptonshire. She was a fearless teenager, out trying to generate support for a group of youngsters who were funding and building their own aircraft as a STEM project. Her self-confidence and enthusiasm were remarkable, and it was obvious that this young lady was going to be one of those people who definitely stand out from the crowd. Organising the media activity around the project and meeting some very senior people didn't faze her at all. Over the years, I've kept in touch and watched her progress and development with interest. So, when we decided to start the short circuit interviews, it was a no-brainer to contact Michelle. Her awards for her impact on youth navigation and contributions to navigation news demonstrates that she is a bright example of the whole STEM and hashtag inspiring aviation ethos. But I'll let you make up your own mind. Let's listen into the conversation. Good afternoon, Michelle. Is it Michelle Chloe Brown or just Michelle Brown? So Chloe is my middle name. Right. Um, and depending on the publication, depends whether or not my middle name gets printed. But mm-hmm. you can call me whatever you like. <laughs> so, yes, it's been a long time, as I just said, it's been a long time since we spoke. Um, and so we're going to ask a few questions. We're going to have a bit of a chat and I'll let you do most of the talking. Okay. Because you're the interesting person here. So I've got a few questions just to uh, keep us on track. So we'll start off with the first one, and that is basically, who are you and what do you have to do with aviation? I feel like that's always a very difficult question to answer. Um, <laughs> as you've said, my name's Michelle. I maybe could be classed as an aviation enthusiast. Um I grew up around aircraft. At the age of 13, I was involved with a charity called the Spirit of Ghoul, and we built a fully functioning Sherwood Ranger XP, which is a type of biplane with folding wings. And with that charity, I had some amazing opportunities. Not only did we get to learn practical skills about actually building the plane, we got to finish it underneath the wing of the Vulcan and I was lucky enough to be on the runway for XH558 last ever flight. Oh wow, um, jealous, jealous. We got to go to, it was incredible, it really was amazing. Um, we've been to lots and lots of air shows, we've been to Cywell, um, the LA Rally, Telford, Waddington, so I've been all around the country and yeah so I suppose that's my aviation tie unfortunately the charity no longer does the aviation side we're currently renovating a boat um so I don't really have much to do with aviation anymore however I am the co-chair of the Royal Institute of Navigation's Younger Members Group. So I've kind of switched from aviation to kind of more the navigation side. And I write in their bi-monthly magazine. I help with their social medias. Um, I co-chair the Younger Members Group. And I also sit on their council membership and fellows committee and their heritage committee. Wow. Okay. All, all these things, I mean, it sounds like you, you kicked off at an early age, got involved with this big project, and since then it's just mushroomed and it's gone in so many different ways and and so on. So I would say, I mean, is when you say you grew up around aircraft, was the Spirit of Gould your introduction? Yes. That, that was your first, um, the first thing. I'd, I'd kind of been around aircraft as a normal person would and when you get to go on holiday and you always find it really cool kind of seeing the aircraft anytime the army was around because 
we have a, quite a few flight paths over where I live. So there's often really low flying aircraft. So you'd always kind of look up and go, oh, that's cool. Um, and I knew the names of a few planes and I'd been on um, commercial planes before, but I'd never been on a light aircraft until I was w involved with the charity. So yes, that was really kind of my kickoff with, um, with it. But I was young when we got involved and yeah like you said now i'm still kind of involved in various ways so mm -hmm. it has definitely mushroomed <laughs> right okay so i, I mean you, you've covered quite a few things already just in, in in that whole thing so in your positions now would, would you say that your involvement with the the spiritual school project was that instrumental or how much of an effect do you reckon that had on your your future so if you if you went back to your 13 year old self now and said by the way in 10 years time or 20 years time or whatever you're going to be doing this and that and and so on um what would your younger self say to you know would would you be amazed or would you be surprised or would you be yeah yeah obvious or this is going to be a really controversial answer Oh, go ahead. So I hope you're ready for this one. <laughs> I think that the project was so successful in my development years that I now feel like I don't achieve anything in life. Wow. Because <laughs> you think you think of that as a highlight. Oh, absolutely. I mean, at the age of 13, 14, I was winning awards with Breitling, with the Royal Institute of Navigation. I was traveling across the country, representing the charity at air shows, at meetings, at various different places. I was scouted to write for the Light Aircraft Association and then the Royal Institute of Navigation. I got to do so many amazing things that when I was younger, I thought, I'm going to be a journalist. I'm going to do this. I can do anything that I want. And now that, I mean, I never wanted to be an engineer or a pilot or anything mm. like that. Don't get me wrong. Media and communications has always been my, my passion. But I look at myself now and I think I've not been on holiday. I've not been traveling to an exciting air show, meeting new people. Theo Pafitas isn't signing the wing of our plane anymore or... I'm not meeting royalty every month or there was a series of, I think it was three months where I got to meet three royals in, in different yeah. royals. Um, it was amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I did so much. And then because of my age, everyone kind of bigged it up a little bit. And there's just like, oh, she's 14 and she's doing this. She's 15. She's finally getting publicized. And now I feel like I've done nothing. The only thing that I think is a major achievement since the spirit of school kind of stopped with the aviation side was that I pitched an idea to Your Horse, which is one of the uh, top leading magazines in the UK, and basically rewrote an article that I did for the Royal Institute of Navigation and made that as a three page spread on the importance of horses' whiskers. Right. And that was kind of a passion project for me. But that was in 2020. And I look at myself now and I think, what have I done? Yes, I get to work in London and I'm hybrid. So I get to stay at home in Yorkshire with the horses and then travel to London a few times a month. But I don't really feel like I do anything cool anymore. Oh, doing something cool. Well, I mean, okay. So the last couple of years with COVID and all the rest of it has put us, I think it has put a damper on everybody's life and development and careers and all that sort of thing. Um, so I, I wouldn't single yourself out or beat, beat yourself up about that too much just now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think coming from where you were and sort of exploding into that scene must have been um, just such a, a bright light, such a contrast from where you were. I, it's difficult, I think, to, to maintain that level um, as you get into adulthood. But I mean... Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're writing articles for and for magazines, if you're sitting on these chairs and these committees and these boards, I mean, you have to recognise that I wouldn't have been doing this if I hadn't been doing that before. Um, oh, absolutely! Yeah. It, it has everything that I'm doing now has spiralled from that charity and from yeah. from the opportunities that I got with there. Um, 
life's just not as exciting when you grow old. <laughs> oh, tell me about that. Uh, yes, I, I think that's more of a function of getting old. But uh, uh, you're not old. Good grief! I mean, when you get, really? when you get to I'm my 25 age, twenty-five next year. Good grief, good grief! Uh, if I if I could be twenty-five again, but that's a different conversation, a different podcast. <laughs> I think. But no, that's wonderful. So the, the whole STEM thing. I mean, did did you find that when you were doing the Spirit of Ghoul? Was it a formal STEM thing or was it just the passion of the people involved and it was like, okay, we're just going to do this uh, despite the, the system? The conception of the charity always makes me laugh. Um, Jack, who was the chairman and kind of the driving force behind everything, he went to the REF because he was working with the cadets and said, let's build a plane. You know, the vigilance of all being grounded. We can't fly. This would be an amazing opportunity to teach them skills, especially if people are wanting to be engineers. And then we can get them flying. And the REF basically said no. So he went, fine, I'll do it myself. And he did. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, he, he's been amazing in the fact that He's a true example of if you want to do something, do it and never let anyone tell you no. Like if you know this could work and if this is something you're really passionate about, don't take no for an answer. And yeah, that really paid off. Um, yeah, the charity was just fantastic. It really was. And the STEM kind of formality wasn't there because we weren't structured. We weren't a school. We weren't with the REF and you have to set a, a set curriculum our goal was finishing the plane and teaching and learning things on the way was a major part of it obviously we had to be trained on how to use tools safely because we use three of the four components um in aviation engineering so we use aluminium plywood uh, fiberglass and as everybody who has ever touched fiberglass knows when you sand it it is so itchy if you get it on yourself. <laughs> so um, it just gets everywhere. I don't know how. It's just clouds everywhere. So, yeah, we had to be taught about safety. And then with the Royal Institute of Navigation's top nav, where we had to learn old school navigation without GPS, there were things that we got to do where we'd learned skills, but it wasn't like a set formula. And I think that worked really well because... A lot of the people that were involved in the project were not necessarily academic. Mm -hmm. um, I use that term very loosely because, as everyone knows, there are different types of learning. People can be a lot more hands-on and then other people are a lot more, oh, let me have a look at a book. Everyone learns differently. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really nice giving the outlet to the people who were not book smart to learn and it showed that they had the intelligence they had the capability because they could do it and they picked it up so so quickly so I think it was a great thing for them and their confidence and the fact that they got to learn in a different manner mm -hmm. excellent that sounds it sounds like it, the way it should be is is these things I mean the, you've mentioned it a couple of times now so this navigation thing sounds like it's really got you it, it seems to have got a hook in you um which yeah like i mean for me if you ask me to navigate around the corner i can do it i can navigate places where i know if you put a map in front of me i am shocking <laughs> um i really am a terrible advocate for navigation i just i really clicked with the group the team that work there are incredible and the members you get so many stories because they're from all walks of life you have young people you have people in their early career who are working for startups and really cool new technology and then you've got the military side and the captains and then the retired gentlemen who or ladies who have stories about life that just seems so fascinating and like it doesn't seem like you're in the same world as them because of their stories and how much things have changed mm -hmm. so for me Rin have hooks me, but it's more about the people than the topic. I mean, I will advocate for navigation all day long because it is so important, but I'm a very bad example. <laughs> right, but that, that so that's actually quite interesting. So it's not so much the, the, the technical side uh, of the navigation that got you, but the, you mentioned the key word there of team. And 
recognizing when when you do have a team and the power of teamwork and all that sort of thing, which all sounds very worthy and a bit blah blah blah. But when you've seen it for real, that's something that's that's special. So would you say that? Uh, I don't don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that something you learned or identified in the the spirit of Google project? Of the, oh, definitely. The, yes. Um, if you ever ask Jack about me in the build sessions, he will say he was constantly shouting at me for putting shoes on because I would sit in the corner of the workshop with a coffee in my hand, my feet up on the desk and watching everyone because I loved the project, don't get me wrong. Building was not my thing. I, I really enjoyed doing the Oritexin and the fiberglass. Not the fiberglass sanding, but the actual kind of like, it's like paper mache because you put it in some glue resin thing and then you fold it over on the joints that you kind of do in or wherever you fiberglass it. And Oritex, which is the material we use to cover the plane, mm -hmm. is a heat shrinking material. So it shrinks between like 5 and 15%, depending on how you do it. Um, and you, I just remember it always like you tap one corner then the other and then you build in and then you slowly do it and I do have a touch of OCD so I'd watch people do it and there'd be a little crease here or a little crease there and I was like no nope, can't do it let me do it and I just took <laughs> over um so there were some things that I did that I really enjoyed but power tools and I don't mind getting dirty I mean I have horses it's the nature of that of the hobby but it just doesn't interest me that much. For me, it was about talking to people, the communication side. Um, and that's what Jack let me thrive on. So I'd be involved with the build sessions, but I'd be there taking pictures or doing the social media posts for the charity or working on grant applications. Um, that was something that I got to do quite a lot was uh, applying to different foundation and organizations and writing pictures basically to them. Um, and getting sponsorships so that was something that I did a lot and yeah it is it's the team I saw the project physically but there was the idea there was the spirit behind it the team and that sense of camaraderie that you didn't have in normal projects so yeah the team makes a massive massive difference mm. I don't think it would have worked if we'd have tried it with anybody else so, so you learn learn those skills and that attitude, and and you've you've taken that forward into your adult life and into your professional life. So, the aviation thing itself, per se, you don't want to be a pilot, you don't want to be an engineer, you don't want to be a mechanic. But the the whole bit with aviation, do you find yourself um, if you overhear a conversation, somebody's talking about planes, are you able to pick them up on it, or do, how much did you absorb? about the aviation side whilst I feel like I absorbed quite a lot um I still remember that we used a demotor engine which was 92 horsepower twin spark plug four cylinder engine if you ask me what engines in my car couldn't tell you I don't even <laughs> know what spark plugs well I probably could figure out what the spark plugs look like if I actually paid attention um to my car but couldn't tell you what engines in my car um so yeah I feel like I picked things up because I was there I was in the midst of it and I heard the conversations and I remembered it it's like a sales pitch in a way you you pick it up because it's impressive it's cool and then you get to go out and tell everybody about it all of your friends about this exciting project that you're doing mm. what do you think would have happened if you hadn't got involved in the spirit of Google? where would you be now I think that's a really interesting question because I think that one of the reasons I thrived in that environment so much is because it aligned with the way that I was brought up. I, my dad always pushed me to do whatever I wanted. He was like, the world's your oyster. That was his phrase. And, and I'd never experienced a setback or a limit or told that I couldn't do something if I'd put my mind to it. So I think I really thrived there. So maybe there are things that I would still have done. I think I'd have still worked in some form of communications, even if, I wasn't involved with the project. I think that just helped me get opportunities and kind of get into it a lot earlier than people would have done. Um, I think the real question is, if I wasn't involved with the project, this sounds really morbid. I think it also depends whether or not my dad would have died or not because he passed away when I was 15. Um, so I think him passing away and having the project, it 
it gave me a new sense of purpose within there because I had something to distract me to throw myself in for friends to be around me and I think that was probably another driving force of me to really go into communications and make those connections and make something of myself because I wanted to do him proud Mm. but I think maybe if he hadn't have passed away and I also hadn't have been involved with the project I would be working with horses full time because I didn't want to go to university (laughs) and yeah I think I'd probably be working with horses right okay okay but your circumstances dictated this, that, the next thing. So you now have best of both worlds. So you still have I do. the horses as a hobby. Yeah. Uh, but you've had these, these life experiences which have broadened horizons uh, and given you these other opportunities and, and so on. So that's, okay, that's fascinating. I mean, I, I, I didn't know much about your history before we started up. You sent me a little bio, which I'll, uh, I'll expand on um, in, the, in the intros. But, um, yeah, I mean, we must have met maybe four or five, half a dozen times at the air shows previously. Yeah. And it always struck me, um, looking at the, the Spirit of Ghoul team, that there was such a variety of, of characters and personalities working together that I found that fascinating and really it was a joyous thing to watch. Uh, and it seems it hasn't done you any harm whatsoever, which is... I, I, Absolutely I, want, not. I wanted to speak to you because I think you're a very good example of how STEM can, even for people who aren't necessarily interested in engineering, it uh, can help them develop and create and do their own thing. So I have got one question because we're, we're sort of getting towards the end of time now. So uh, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, there you go. Um, so the one question I have, which we're asking all our uh, interviewees is to pick one aircraft mm-hmm. their favorite what it what it is and uh what the outstanding or the top trump thing that, that about that aircraft which you know sticks out for them so we're putting we, 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 we've got an imaginary leaderboard pasted on the side of our imaginary control tower so we've got a couple of planes up there already so what are you going to put on there and why you're going to laugh at this. No, go ahead. So, my favourite aircraft is probably a Robin. And it's because when we were building the plane, we used to go to Breton. We had some Chevrons, which are light aircraft, mm-hmm. um, well, micro lights. And we used to fly them. And in the hangar, there was this Robin that had like a sparkly burgundy colour with some white stripes and it had cream leather seats in. And it was beautiful. And I always remember saying, that's the plane that I want. Um, I never flew in it. I really wish I did. I never flew in it. But I think it was a four-seater. It was beautiful absolutely beautiful um so i think that would probably be it however if the vans or rans r7 had a better interior it would be that because there was a guy called mark turner who took me up in his plane and it was um aerobatic capabilities it was blue and had white checkers along the side beautiful plane but inside it was very basic and like most planes are, to be honest. And I'd like a little bit of luxury in life to be. So maybe if the <laughs> interior was better, one of them, because we got to 197 knots with a wow. tailwind behind us up towards Spurn Point, And it was a fantastic flight. But the interior let the plane down. <laughs> right. OK, so we, we'll go with Robin um, based on aesthetics, yep. aesthetics and style. Pretty much. Yeah, but which is all valid reasons for choosing something. So uh, that's that's my that is a surprise though. You did surprise me because I thought, uh, is she gonna go for the for the 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 spirit of ghoul show with Ranger? Oh, absolutely not. With it being a biplane, open cockpit. If you have your hair down, <laughs> wind not a good idea. <laughs> and there we have the priorities. That is absolutely <laughs> yes. brilliant. Absolutely. Brilliant. <laughs> no, that's that's fantastic. Well, Michelle, so to to summarise then, so we have um, a young girl kicked off in um, in Yorkshire, uh, got involved with the project, uh, got herself immersed in that project, took it to the end with uh, her teammates, they got the plane flying, 
And during that time, she met royalty, she traveled, she learned a whole bunch of communication skills and is now working in communication. She's working with navigation. Uh, she's writing articles and still ma maintains her contact with horses for a hobby, but still has the wherewithal and the knowledge to choose a, a purple sparkly robin with a beautiful interior as her favorite aircraft, which I think it just sums up the whole thing just perfectly. So uh, Michelle Brown, thank you very much for your time. Brilliant. It's been so lovely speaking to you and catching up. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been good. And uh, really? I hope you enjoyed yourself here on what we're calling uh, the Short Circuit podcast. Short Circuit. I love that name. Thank you very much. Well, very fitting. Speak to you later. Bye. Bye. So that was Michelle Brown. I found our chat quite remarkable and revealing. The impact of getting involved with a STEM project is obvious, even though she is more inclined to the arts and communication side of things rather than the technical aspects. The support of the group and the focus provided by the project was fundamental during a difficult period of her life, and the experience has helped her mature into a successful young woman with drive, determination and the confidence to forge her way in life. While writing, public relations and media activity might not be obvious aspects of aviation, the involvement with STEM and the mentoring of those passionate about flight had a profound effect. Those skills have transferred directly into her career and her activity with the Royal Institute of Navigation will not have gone unnoticed. Her communication skills and experience have placed her in positions of authority and, of course, now she has some unique anecdotes to tell at corporate events. Who would guess that she helped build a plane when she was just a nipper? Well, dear listener, we end this episode of The Short Circuit. I hope you found Michelle's story as inspiring as I did. Thanks for listening and fly safe. You have been listening to The Short Circuit, presented by Mike McLean and sponsored by Swift Aircraft with the hashtag InspiringAviation. This has been a Zoom Spike production.